G'day everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Christie David. I run a mortgage broken business called Atelier Wealth, where we specialize in helping property investors start out and scale up their portfolios. But what we're really in the business of is giving you confidence about how to buy and build your portfolio through knowledge and off the back of that, finding people what I call best in breed. Now, if you've been down to the Illawarra, uh, not only have you loved the beaches and the cafes, but you've probably seen a lot of pink for sale signs. Uh, and if you've seen them, you know that brand is Molina McNeese. And one half of the powerhouse team is in our studio today. Trevor, welcome to the studio, man. Aaron, thank you. Yeah, absolute pleasure to have you here. Uh, mate, you've got, a, you've got a career in real estate that has stood the test of time. Obviously, you, uh, you live and you breathe this. Mm. Uh, with the back of that comes success. Off the back of that, um, there's rewards. I mean, I'm reading here, Chairman of the Real Estate uh, Institute, Illawarra, Sales Manager, Principal of the Year, Industry Accolades, for example. Um, that comes off the back of hard work, but also it's your calling as well, right? And mm. um, I, I call it an experience share. I've had the privilege of working with yes, you have, yeah, to, have, yeah. to buy our own place. Um, and I've seen the professionalism, not only for yourself, but your team as well, because you set the bar up here. And there's probably a reason why your market share is extremely high. It's because um, you're getting results for vendors. But from the other experience, buyers are getting great experience as well, working with you, which means, you know, buyers often feel like the real estate agent's there to work for the vendor, but it's both parties. Mm. It's the buyer experience and the vendor experience, which we want to touch on a little bit later as well. But what I really want to uh, start off with is what I call the three P's. So a little bit about yourself personally, a okay. bit about yourself professionally, a bit about your own property journey as well, Trev. Okay, so I guess personally, um, um, two kids, married, yep. two kids, lived in northern suburbs, so live and breathe in northern suburbs. Yeah. Um, I guess outside of real estate, there isn't too much <laughs> that you have time to do. You've got one day, so it's very family orientated. Yeah. Um, probably professionally, um, I've been doing this 20 plus years, mm. probably what you say, um, a career professional on that note. So yeah. real estate does get a lot of people jumping in and out, um, but I've been doing this since... Well, a, a while. Um, you start sort of stop counting after twenty, I guess. Yeah. Um, I've been a business owner for probably fifteen years of that yeah. too. So, because you've had a journey where you've gone worked real estate agents, built the office up, for example, mm. managed a lot of team, and now you've gone on to have your name on the door, right? So that's a that's a yeah that's a progression and evolution in real estate. It, you, you talk about the turnover. Sorry, mm. jump in, but the turnover and we see it not only in broking but also real estate, which is. It's 100% commission based, it's not for everyone, it is a sales business and mm. some people love it and some people, it's not for them as yeah. well, right? It sounds easy, like everyone thinks, oh, I love real estate, <laughs> I love houses, let's go do that. It's, it's got nothing to do with houses, um, but it, it is it is not for everyone, it's commission based and things like that. But yeah, yeah I, I did, I started as an agent and then worked my way through and we owned a, a quite a large franchise, we had 60 plus people working for us, um, three mm. offices. And then decided to change that and put the name on the door, and that's where mine and me started. Probably Fantastic. five years ago now. Yeah, to the week. yeah, yeah. And in that five years, you've experienced. I mean, you say we talk about the northern suburbs. So for the uninitiated, um, north of Wollongong, we're talking areas like Austin, Mitherul, Bulai, Winuna, and, and now you've got a really good presence kind of going through Wollongong. Mm. So you guys go further south as well. So that that. Business, your business building itself and its presence through the through the northern Illawarra and out down through Wollongong and south, um, it's it's showing itself. Five years in, you've got credibility, you've got results as well, and some incredible sales you know, on beachside properties, for example, multi million dollar properties. And there are some units that I mean, some of probably your younger agents are now yeah. cutting their teeth on as well. Yeah, I guess because we've been doing it so long, you, you kind of as an agent, you work through your price ranges too. We, we're lucky enough to do some high end sales, but yeah. it's not only just about high end sales. We kind of make every property look high end too. Yeah. So it's it we're known for making what property properties look really good. Um, and that's sort of then, I guess, encroaching to a lot of the apartment sales and things mm. like that off the back of it. And our team is obviously doing a lot more in those side of things too. Yeah. Uh, you and I were just having a chat before about there's the this northern Illawarra, so the south coast, for example, just very similar to the central coast, went through this real mm. boom, which was sea changes coming out of Sydney. And then there's there's a real shift that starts to happen. Uh, I can put my hand up and say, I'm yeah. one of them. Yeah. Um, and chase the lifestyle, chase a bit more balance for family, bang for your buck is another one as well. Uh, and then that in turn shifts the dynamics and demographics, demographics. of a particular area, mm. right? So you've seen that because you've been in the Northern Illawarra for so long. So dealing with families, you know, 
maybe 10, 15 years ago to what you're dealing with now, yeah. that's got to be a real change from what you're seeing and feeling, right? I, I was actually reminiscing last week, yeah. 25 years ago, I remember yeah. I going to Wombara, a, a suburb that was kind of out of the way, yeah. but there were little shanties up there, and this is going to sound really funny to a lot of people, <laughs> there were shanties out there where people were squatters effectively, wow. and they were one-room houses that you'd have four like kids. Old mining cottages. For, Something yeah, like Charlie yeah. and the Chocolate Factory. So, <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't the norm, but we were seeing stuff like that too. Today, where you've got multi-million dollar beach houses and some really affluent people living here and things mm. like that too. So it's really gentrified. There's, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. None of the agents in the area said, this is the change that was meant to come because we were sitting, we as in like this area, was sitting on like a gold mine mm. and it was always ripe for this and people only just discovered it. Yeah. Is that the sentiment that you that yeah. you see and feel as well? Yeah, I think if you're born and bred here, we're only an hour away from the centre of Sydney. So a lot, a lot of people do commute to the city, uh, the city, sorry. Yeah. And so it really has changed from that and that's what's the big focal point. I actually think the Illawarra still is undervalued. When you compare it to regional areas that have what we have, I still think we're undervalued. Mm. And what is the attraction? So being an agent, someone moving down, they're like, why the south coast compared to say the north coast for example from your experience yeah it's it's funny and i mean most people north they gen- generally move north to the north coast and, and right. south but I, I think the beaches the the community we have here is really nice and you're you're finding that now but Absolutely. it's a really good schooling area it's a really good sporting area yeah um and it's picturesque it's it's really one of those ones and i think a lot of people that that live in sydney have holiday down here and they kind of come back to that too mm. oh, absolutely it's um you get really familiar with the area, but also you're right. There is a there is a real vibrancy in the community, mm. and now we're starting to see. Uh, I can remember because when I was dating Bernadette, my now <laughs> wife, um, and Bernie went to the University of Wollongong. We went to Thoreau mm. for dinner. Oh, I'm going to say like ten years ago. There was a Gloria Jeans, On the and corner. there was yeah. one Thai restaurant. Mm. Now it's known for its Thai restaurants and its cafes, yeah. right? And I've had a chat with Matt Sharp, buyers agent up in Central Coast. The cafe culture just really kind of, I guess, supercharges an area going, it now becomes funky, it becomes mm. gentrified, it becomes a destination, for example, as well. And I think the rules kind of put itself on the map. Yeah, really because it has that village. It still has that village community. Bow yeah. Downey has a little village too that people yeah. don't notice. And I think Port Kembla is becoming like that too. There you go. It's, so it's an area that's really gentrifying and, and it has still the beach. And it's an area on the southern side of Wollongong that's really one to watch out for too. Yeah. So let's talk about because investors, these are areas that I hear investors speak a lot, mm. right? And, and, and our community is investors. So what is the attraction as an investor to these particular areas, do you think? I'm talking Port Kembla has come up a number of times. And I've seen some big plans for Port Kembla. Mm. Um, Thoreau, there's, you know, there is development slated for Thoreau and, and it becomes one of those areas that I guess is a first stop because of the train line and yeah. and it's the villagey feel to it. And you mentioned a few other areas as well. So investor side, what yeah. are you seeing from your experience? I think if you're looking for growth, anything around water. And so uh, the northern suburbs has boomed and is booming, um, but you'll find there still is some good buyers there. But I, I think Port Kembla, so the, the good ones to watch out for in my view is Port Kembla, uh, Oak Flats, um, areas like Primby that are on the lake. So those ones I don't think have exploded just yet. Yeah, okay. We've recently sold something on the lake, the big money now. So I think people are just starting to work out that they can't get into the northern suburbs to be on the water at that money. Mm. Now they're moving to the lake side and I'm finding that there's going to be good growth in that area too. Yeah. And we speak about the next suburb across effect and I always used to say like... The new, Ripple. Yeah. yeah, the Ripple. Like Start out like Newtown. Yep. Couldn't afford Newtown. Became like Erskineville, Marrickville, for example, at Blossom. Bondi then formed Coogee, for example, mm. Coogee to Maroubra. Um, and what you're saying there is a very similar thing, which is it was Osti, then it's the rule, and then it's Bulai. Now, you know, Munun is slowly catching up. And now you're seeing similar southern um, yeah. areas start to kind of take yeah, off. Guys generally will start. They'll come down. They'll either start in Osti or Thoreau. That's yeah. the go-to where everyone knows. And yeah. then the ripple effect, they'll just move down suburbs until they can find their price point that really works. Yeah, okay. But even if you look at where they started in Sydney, they, they generally started – probably in the eastern suburbs. Yeah. And, and as they grow up, they, they kind of priced themselves out. So a lot of young people then went down to the Shire. Yeah. And then what's happened is they've sort of priced themselves out of the Shire as the next generation has come through. They've then moved to the Illawarra or the northern suburbs of the Illawarra and then those have grown up. So the yeah. next generation again, and then people are being priced out of, I guess, the northern suburbs, they're heading south. The people from south are generally going down to the far south coast. So mm. it's a ripple effect. 
outside of Sydney that is, is always and has always been the case. Yeah. And I guess an on the ground experience is a lot of families are now wrestling with this, right? I think this is something as investors we don't typically get a good look at mm. is families were here, mum and dad, and the kids were expected to almost buy in and around the area. Now they can't buy them. Mm. I guess coming from Sydney, I've always known that because you never bought where your parents lived, yeah. you never would have afforded yeah. it. Um, so you don't start where they've ended up. But I guess for the South, it was quite accessible previously for family to be close by. But now this community is wrestling with, I can't actually have my kids close by. We're not close to our parents, for mm. example. And they're probably, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes south, for example, in an area that they can afford, right? It's happening. And we, we hear it on from buyers all the time. And we yeah. hear it on all those community groups on Facebook and things. <laughs> they're all saying that oh, the place is getting too expensive and how are our kids going to buy into it? Yeah. But that's that's been happening for a long time. So people aren't effectively growing up in an area and buying back into it. They're all heading into a different area. So yeah. it's been happening for a while. Changing gears a little bit, right? And so... I deal with potential clients looking to buy. Mm. And one of the big, uh, one of the big things that we do when someone's pre-approved is we call it a property buying session because there's no loan without a property. So they can be out there pounding the pavement, looking for property. But one of the common uh, roadblocks they get is dealing with a real estate agent. Mm. Say the agent's not the enemy. The agent's there to sell the property for the vendor. We need to find a win-win. And quite often they're like, Mm. the buyers have been, I'm not going to gross generalization here, They've been made to feel like the enemy is the agent. They're a little bit cagey, don't trust everything they say, which with all due respect, I don't, it maybe goes for a couple of agents mm. or a percentage, just like there's any industry has their, their apple, their bad apples. But having dealt with yourself, it's like there's a process to follow. Yeah. The property is going to go to auction. Follow that. If you want to make a pre-auction offer, go nuts, but it has to be fairly strong or competitive. Yeah. Otherwise, just like everyone else, it's a level playing field. Put your best foot forward. So if I'm a potential buyer going through the experience, what separates a bad buyer from a good or a great buyer from your perspective? Okay. Yeah, then that's a good question because I actually, and to start this off, I make no bones about I'm paid by the owner. Yeah. So and buyers always, I hear it, oh, you made me t- pay too much or whatever it may be. That's actually what a good agent's paid. So yeah. they're paid by the owner. You want that agent when you're going to go sell your property yeah, as well because yeah, you want the so. best result. And, yeah. and that's what. And if you want to be on the other side, get a buyer's agent. And you've spoken to buyer's agents before yeah. on this podcast and, and that's what you do to level the playing field too. So mm. effectively, we are paid by the owner to get the best terms and the best price. So that's, and I make no bones about it when I start a negotiation off. Yeah. But what you said before about if you can make a transaction very clean. Yes. And it's all about education. If you can educate a buyer well enough to say, okay, here's the terms of the playing field, as long as we all know what's going on and communicate effectively, that's half the battle. I think a lot of buyers kind of get frustrated with just the lack of communication. And and that's probably where they kind of feel like they've been dudded or missed out on a property because they haven't been told. And I guess 20 or 30 years ago, it was the Wild West because there were no rules. There were no laws and things Mm. like that. And, And now I think the real estate industry is really tightened up and our work with real estate um, industry has really shown us that there are laws in place now that you can't do those things anymore yeah. too. So, so we have to do those things. It's like, you can't say there's an offer when there's no offer. Yeah, exactly. Right? And, and that's a moral thing too. I think yeah. that comes from within as well. I mean, yeah. if that's the kind of person you are, then fair be it. So, but it really comes down to there, there are laws in place for, pre, we're a very regulated industry now. Mm. So there's certain things that you need to do without with, through the whole process. But to answer your question, what makes a good offer and a bad offer? I think, Firstly, the agent needs to set the deal up too. And it's different if it's going for sale or for auction. Yeah, okay. Um, but the buyer needs to be, again, in your court, they need to be fully aware of their finance. That's the first thing. I, I don't think any agent really takes too much notice of someone who hasn't got their finance sorted. Um, they, they don't know where they're going as far as that goes. Mm. Um, that's that's the first part of the, the, the puzzle that we really look for. Which is so chicken the egg because the amount of times that we're saying the same message mm. to a client which is you're looking at property, get yourself organized, get yourself organized, get pre-approved, and then all it takes is one listing to come up and like, bang, we're on. Yeah. And it's almost like we're on the back foot because they've seen the property, they've fallen in love, and now we've got to try and make this offer without finance in place. Yeah. And then it doesn't, look, it doesn't gel well from a client experience for us because mm. now we're reactive. And then from your and your, your team's perspective, well, you want the property or not, and, and you know we what? can't really help if your finance isn't ready. Yeah. And they either end up missing the property of their dreams or they pay more. Yeah. And the reason why they pay more is because their terms aren't ready. 
So if you're finance approved, you're ready to roll, you have your pest and building sorted, your, your conveyance is sorted, all those things, and you can go X, Y, and Z, you're there, you're, you're an owner's dream. Yeah. But if you have to get your finance sorted, you don't know what sort of settlement terms you have and all that, you end up having to make a higher offer just to make yourself look good. And in, mm. and in most terms, most owners won't look at it anyway. Yeah, yeah, no, sage advice. Take that advice. We're talking about a top real estate agent sharing insights and knowledge. Uh, so don't hear it from me because I sound like a, a broken record yep. with the same message. Uh, from the same perspective, we're on the same team. Yep. We, want, we want the client, the buyer, to get the property of their dreams. It's the home they see themselves in. I've been there. I've done that. We want the home. We go through the process and there's a price to pay. Yep. No one ever wants to overpay for a property, but if it's fair market value, it's fair market value. Now, we spoke before as well, kind of beforehand, about the market. Mm. And there's a real shift. Um, there's a real change in the market. There was the intense COVID. If you don't buy it today, it's gone tomorrow for a higher price and mm. good luck. And now we're starting to see it. You know, that intensity just start to dissipate a little bit from the market. Call it rising rates, call it borders opening up for travel and lifestyle as well. And just, I guess, return to office you know, type of scenarios as well. From boots on the ground perspective, what are you seeing? the shift in the market look like for yourself as well, Trevor? Yeah, I guess, firstly, I like this market. Oh, I don't <laughs> as, an, as an experienced agent, I kind of, yeah. anyone could sell a property six months ago. Six and months. the peak of the market was around November and it started to gradually drop off from there. Yeah. So when it comes down to the market, there was a fear of missing out. So FOMO was definitely there last year. Yeah. If they missed an auction or a property, chances are the same property would be worth more by the time it settled. So it was so literally, true. it was going up so quick, as you know, yeah. that people were just jumping in and throwing money. Now that's changed. So vendors are a little bit more aware now that the market has softened. And that is because of what you said, that's it's interest rates, it's back to normality. People aren't as focused on real estate as what they were six yeah. months ago. Um, and so there's been a real shift back to that. So it, it's not where, okay, a property sold at this level, the next time it's worth that level. We have taken a bit of a hit as far as pricing. But because we're in such a small area, when we don't have massive tracts of land in the Illawarra yeah. that we're just opening up. So we're relatively stable when it comes to capital growth. So we're not, even in the GSC, we didn't drop a lot as a lot of different areas do. Yeah. And that's that becomes super important to, to elaborate on that point. So I guess what, what market commentators are saying is because there's not a lot of building supply coming mm. on, okay, that's going to help protect price falls uh, because there's such low vacancy rates. You know, people that want to rent still want to move into the market. So that's that's tightly held. Migration starting to pick up. So there's going to be you know, more demand as well. So there's some of the saving graces that will come. But if you've bought in a really good area that has tight supply and there's not a, not a lot that can come on, you can almost safeguard yourself against price fluctuations because it's tightly held, always in demand, high owner-occupied appeal, great uh, vacancy rates if you're an investor as well mm. trying to trying to hold and, and rent that property out yeah yeah and there's going to be a lot more investors coming back into the market mm. um, they were out of the market because it was too hot there was no there was no good yields deals terrible, out there yeah. yields are terrible so there's going to be a lot more so you'll find that because pe less people will be buying the rents will go up too so rents will start to to gradually incline and then investors will be coming back into the market yeah. too so with rents increasing like what's there is a process right to increase rents as well mm. I mean, this is, for an investor as an investor you go I just jack up rent. It's not that easy just to go, I'm going to hoik the rent up either. No. There's got to be a process around that as well. Yeah, if they're in a fixed term lease, obviously you can't jack the rent up and you can only raise the rent by a certain portion as well. It's a percentage that you can't you can't go and just jack it up by $500 a week. Mm. So there's a certain process that you go by. You either change tenants and give the property a renovation or something like that and yeah. that will certainly change the rent. But if it's low market rent already, then you can't just go and add another fifty percent onto it too. Mm, yeah, perfect. I guess the just to close the loop on this, mate. From your perspective, um, message to vendors at the moment. What, what's your general conversation that you're having for a lot of vendors? I think a lot of conversations. So pre, I guess the end of the year, if they're still on the market now, it's a very different marketplace. A yeah. lot of the media has done this for us already. So yeah. the, the the questions have already been posed. Uh, where we find that. I think vendors coming into the market already know that the market has softened now. Yeah. So we've got to have a number of, we've got to have a pricing structure really spot on. We've got to have a great method of sale. We've got to have our marketing done properly too. So mm. any person could have sold their home six, 12 months ago. Let's face it. You, you, um, you literally, had to, no offense, yeah, you had to open the door. It's very broken. So. You just yeah. had to submit a loan and you got, you got it approved, yeah. right? Um, 
same in real estate, which was open the door, it sold itself, it was such high demand. Yeah, yeah. And there'll be a lot of agents jumping out of the industry for that reason. They haven't seen the ups and downs. Yeah. I've seen so many fluctuations <laughs> in, in the last couple of decades, but yeah. they haven't seen that too. So the message to owners is, look, get it right first time. Mm. If you're, It used to be where you're on the market two weeks, people started to wonder why. Yeah. It's not uncommon now to see a 90-day program and things like that too. Yeah, okay. Marketing's got to be spot on. You've got to have a really sound um, pricing structure. And those sort of, and as long as you've got a great agent that understands the market, you should be fine. Yeah, great. And then the message to buyers is exactly what we said before: get your finance sorted beforehand, um, yeah. because that's a process. It takes time, and you've Correct. got to you've got to do your job too. And if you're rushing, you don't you can't find the best position for them in the loan. Yeah. Um, but make sure you're all equipped too. So understand what it takes to make an offer, what what it takes to sign a contract. Go and speak to a pest and building guy if you want to. Understand what they're about. Yeah. Go and speak to a conveyancer and sort out who you've got. So just put all your ducks in a row. Speak to some good agents and ask them what they need to do because everyone's a little bit different how they negotiate as well. Um, but certainly go and see some open houses. But before you do that, get yourself sorted first. Yeah, great. And then for investors, uh, do you would you have, say, a suite of properties that are off-market or pre-market listings that you go, hey, look, I'm, I'm an investor. I'm looking for X, Y, Z. And... Yeah, kind of bank up a, a a bit of a brief there for them as the right property comes on. You can match them as well. Is yeah, it? and and most agents will have their own buyer pool of who does what, but yeah. certainly our landlords as well. Uh, they get they get a landlord first email that basically is our handpicked properties of what we think are the best. Um, I guess landlord properties that they could buy, um, yeah, nice. or investment properties. So things like that. Um, certainly having a suite of buyers that are investors because certain properties are, are great investments mm. and others aren't. Like the, the family homes are not an investment sort of Fine. property. So these ones over here are what really work and they're the ones that really, certainly like um, unstrated blocks of units and things like that. Mm. Investors just gobble them up. Yeah, spot on. Hey, thank you very much. Is, no um, when I say it just rolls off the tongue, is, we're talking about user experience. We're talking about your heart's in the right place. We're talking about being you know, best in breed when it comes to your industry and the area as well. So to me, to have you here, first of all, I just want to really say thank you very much. Really appreciate and sharing your knowledge and your insights. Um, it's uh, it's a public service, mate. So thank you very much. Uh, Good to be here. Thanks, yeah. Aaron. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, that's a wrap for another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. If you found our chat helpful and you want to reach out to Trevor and his team at Mullen and McNeese, we'll include his details and his team's details as well. Uh, like I said, uh, top real estate agent, but on top of that, just a really top guy as well. Uh, That's a wrap for another episode. We'll see you next time. Thanks very much.